Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to one of the very first sessions of today's Horasis meetings. I'm Swaha Patnaik, the Global Economics Editor of Reuters Breaking Views, the commentary division of Reuters News. It's my pleasure to be here with you today, albeit virtually, and with a very distinguished panel that will discuss Joe Biden's presidency and the outlook for the U US economy. So joining me today are Francisco Sanchez, former under US Under Secretary of Commerce, Jerry Halton, Chair of the New York Academy of Sciences, Ryan Bourne, the R. Evan Scharf Chair for the Public Understanding of Economics at the Cato Institute and soon to be published author uh, on a book that he's going to probably name check when he's talking, and J.D. Gordon, a former Pentagon spokesman. The topic they, we are going to address today is will President Biden make the U.S. economy great again? It's true, the U.S. economy does face some big challenges and some big challengers. But it's still at the top of the global economic league table, has the world's premier currency, reserve currency, and is going to be probably the first G7 economy to regain its pre-COVID GDP levels. So we could argue that what we're actually going to talk about is how great will President Biden make the US economy and in what ways? But that's up for discussion between the panel and you. So we're going to start with each of the panelists having five minutes and quite a strict five minutes, so we give everybody time, equal time. And then we will open it up both for the panelists to challenge each other's contentions and also for you to have your say. So we'll start with Jerry. Over to you, and I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. It's good to be with Horasis again. Uh, I'm waiting for when we do this physically. But let me dig right into this. First, I have to say, if you live in America, you should appreciate what a great piece of fortune that is for you to think that we can spend as much money as we have to return our economy to strength is a real tribute to the strength of the American system. And it's a one that many nations don't enjoy. Uh, so I want to say right off the bat that, that to have this opportunity to shape the economy with this strength is a great opportunity for Joe Biden. So I have three points to make about why I think Joe Biden's economic policies and plans will succeed. The first is, it's bigger, it's bigger than bigger. Joe Biden. Indeed. Indeed. The, he has been given a gift in many ways, the end of the COVID pandemic and the return to a new normal. To, so whether he did anything, we would be getting better. The question might be timing. So first, he's riding a great wave, and he needs to ride it well. Secondly, he has. If you look at what he's already accomplished in terms of bringing back America, building a better bridge to a better America, he's passed the $1.9 trillion rescue plan and has uh, in the works the recovery plan with significant additional investments in the U.S. economy. These are really bold moves, which some will contend are excessive, but with the depth of loss of jobs, the loss of income, the loss of buying power in America, the return to uh, the American consumer is critically important. And we've seen them use this money wisely, food, rent, health care, education, so this is a real investment in the strength of all the American people. America's done quite well recently for the top 20%, maybe the top 1% even better. But for many in America, this has not been a decade or two decades of increasing prosperity. This is an opportunity to make a change to that. Third, the reason why I think he will succeed is there's a clock ticking. It's called 2022, the midterm congressional elections. If the Biden plan doesn't take effect and hold in the next 18 months, those elections, as close as the Senate is, will fall to the Republican Party, and likely the House, with a slim majority, falls to the Republican Party. That's the end of Joe Biden's ability to govern. At that point, he needs to essentially learn how to compromise significantly, and we saw how hard that was for Obama. So 
that clock is ticking and that his team knows that clock's ticking. So they will act quickly, strongly, and with agility. So remember, not everything needs to be done exactly as you thought you would start. But if you can, if you can change your focus, move with the times, you can succeed in this next 18 months. There's a second clock, 2024. And if you win in 2022, you've got a second clock ticking, which is the presidency. Those will cause his team to pay attention. And let's look just briefly at his team. He's brought in a set of players that have governing experience, governors of states, Romano, Commerce, Grantham, uh, Energy. He's brought in people of diversity so that he'll buy into a greater part of America and a better understanding of what real Americans need versus what often happens. You saw the recent policy studies. Top 10% of most societies shape the policy of their countries. 90% are basically bystanders. That's an expensive proposition because slowly it erodes political consensus and actually the growth of the major part of your population, which you need to be consumers. If those 90% aren't doing well, the top 10% slowly lose their wealth because their wealth is all based on the view that there are buyers of products, buyers of services. They disappear. So for these three reasons, I could name others. I could put a fourth on the table. The world will do well with what Biden is doing because, as they said, by the first stimulus checks, as soon as the checks went out, orders went in China, orders went into Europe. The green economy will mean great things for Europe because they've been ahead of us on green economy. So bring the technology in, match up with American businesses, make things happen. So the world will appreciate this. And finally, Joe Biden's given the signal that he cares about the rest of the world. And I think that's a great signal because we are in a global economy. We may be shifting somewhat more to national resilient production. Good. It's good for all countries to be strong. But it's still a global economy, depending on all of us to be in this together. So for those reasons, first, we're recovering from COVID. I'll give credit to the Trump administration. The vaccine coming on in 12 months, amazingly powerful. In fact, I would argue if Donald Trump had taken that opportunity to tout what he'd accomplished, he'd be president because the vaccine was a remarkable thing. Second, Joe Biden has a strong plan. Three, there's a clock ticking and he has a strong team and that team will deliver. He will ensure they deliver because he intends to win. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, um, and for keeping to time. Um, Ryan, I will hand over to you next if you want to go. Well, thank you, Sohan. It's great to be with you today. Um, I'd agree with Jerry. The question, will President Biden make the US economy great again, in debating terms, is kind of itself loaded with implicit questions. How much power do presidents really have over economic outcomes? What constitutes a great economy? And what specific impacts will President Biden's policies have on the economy compared to those goals? And I will attempt to kind of answer the overall question by answering each of those sub questions. So first of all, I think um, we'd all agree the president can clearly affect economic outcomes in numerous ways, including through the legislative process or through the power of his executive appointments. But I think economists would recognize that economic aggregates the sorts of things we usually regard as economic health, indicators of economic health, are actually largely determined by factors beyond the president's control. Uh, The business cycle, unforeseen events such as global uh, pandemics, demographics, and the degree of technological um, innovation. And in respect of these kind of powerful forces, as Jerry mentioned, Joe Biden is somewhat fortunate. He entered office after a deep pandemic-induced downturn from which there's only really one way to go. Um, Of course, in economic welfare terms, the the pandemic is kind of costing us between 10 and $15 billion per week in terms of lost output and lost lives. Um, So anything the president can do in the near term to accelerate the end of the pandemic through speeding up vaccinations are unusually consequential. 
Um, but with nearly a third of small businesses still closed relative to January 2020, including half of leisure and hospitality firms, and with households sitting already on 1.6 trillion of excess savings, I think a significant economic rebound would happen this year once people are vaccinated and restrictions are lifted, almost regardless of the Biden administration's actions. And this bounce back will dominate everything else we talk about in terms of magnitudes. That said, I think, again, we'd all agree that good structural policies can get a, an economy closer to being great in the longer term. And I would say that a great economy has three components. First, a great economy requires robust, sustainable, productivity-driven growth, the sort of which we, we really had in the late 1990s. Growth helps ease all other economic problems. It makes politics less distributional. It eases pressure on the public finances, improves human welfare, and makes up for a lot of the headwinds we'll see uh, in regard an aging population. Second, a great economy has tight labour markets with low unemployment, which looking at Europe um, over the last couple of decades is clearly not guaranteed. Here, I think greatness would merely mean a return to the pre-pandemic world. We had the lowest unemployment rate since the summer of 1969 before COVID hit. Prime age employment had risen to its uh, pre-Great Recession peak. The lowest unemployment rate for black and African Americans since records began for those individual categories and the same for um, Hispanic and Latinos. Household incomes rose by their highest ever amount in 2019. So it's difficult to see how that could be uh, bettered very, very quickly. Finally, a great economy is adaptive. The pandemic has been a major shock to the economy and that will necessitate a lot of churn of jobs and businesses. We don't know yet what the longer term impacts of this crisis will be on consumer demands or work from home practices. So we need the economy to be as open and, fle and flexible as possible to new business models and ways of doing things. We need that kind of inbuilt market resilience. And ultimately, I think when you look at these three, um, three things that constitute economic greatness, in my view, uh, Joe Biden's policy agenda um, I don't think is up to the challenge. I don't think it will deliver faster long-term trend growth. Um, I think a lot of the things in regard labor markets will be quite damaging uh, to employment levels. And I don't see much there that will improve the resilience or the adaptiveness of the economy. The Democrats have pushed through a big relief bill, but that's less about sustainable trend growth and more about demand side stimulus. Um, in fact, some of it I think will harm the near-term adaptiveness of the economy. Uh, generous unemployment benefits through September may be regarded as necessary through as a kind of ongoing relief measure, but they, I think, will deter job shifting as the economy reopens. Um, neither Joe Biden nor his party appear to be particularly animated by the benefits of economic growth as a goal, but rather more nebulous concepts such as equity, or in fact, they prioritize things where there's a clear growth trade-off, such as um, climate change mitigation. Joe Biden's executive orders on regulation have already undone a lot of the transparency on regulations delivered under the Trump administration. And uh, one executive order in particular appears to have given regulators carte blanche to find regulatory benefits that are difficult or impossible to quantify. That hardly screams a desire to return to try to increase the economy's growth rate or deliver market tested resilience. And finally, and perhaps most consequentially, Despite the pre-pandemic labor market strength, the Democrats want to overhaul much um, labor market um, regulation and employment law in ways that I think will raise the natural rate of unemployment. Um, they want to introduce a $15 federal minimum wage, which I think uh, will be pretty damaging in low productivity areas of the country. Uh, the PRO Act, which they're trying to pass, uh, trashes much of the, the gig and freelance uh, economy by trying to shoehorn um, individual contractors into employee status. And um, the PRO Act also effectively precludes against right to work laws, which are currently in operation in 27 states. So while I think there are no doubt areas where, where Biden will be a big improvement on the last administration, uh, particularly on uh, immigration and potentially trade, though um, the, the signals there are not good so far from a kind of free traders perspective, I think much of the rebound we will kind of inevitably see has little to do with Joe Biden. 
And I see much in Joe Biden's agenda with, that would actually prevent the US from fulfilling its full greatness potential. What an economy with high growth, low unemployment and inbuilt resilience. Thank you, Ryan. Um, lots of food for thought and probably for disagreement, but uh, let me hand over to Francisco next, perhaps to rebut some of those comments. Well, thank you, Swaha. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you and with my fellow panelists, Ryan, Jerry, and JD. Um, it will probably be no surprise to my fellow panelists and probably to the audience that I reach a different conclusion than Ryan does. Um, to get the U.S. economy going again, <clears throat> President Biden is looking to the lowest paid workers uh, in the United States and to people who are currently unable to work at all. Uh, the 1.9 trillion economic relief package uh, overwhelmingly helps low wage workers and the middle class. Um, and honestly, with little direct uh, benefit or aid to uh, high earners um, who have largely been able to keep their job during the pandemic. So the plan is really focused on people more than businesses. And uh, in particular, they help women and majority and minorities, rather, who have taken really an outsi outsized hit uh, during this pandemic. Now, independent researchers uh, say that this could be, this relief package could be one of the most effective um, initiatives to uh, fight poverty in probably more than a generation. Uh, according to Columbia University's Center for Poverty and Social Policy, uh, they estimate that uh, low-income Americans with children uh, would reduce the poverty rate, uh, would see the poverty rate reduced by as much as 25%, um, and the poverty rate of children by as much as 50%. Uh, and to put that in other terms, about 93% of all of our nation's children, about 69 million, uh, are going to receive benefits. Um, so, so what is President Biden doing by this kind of focus? Well, he's betting uh, that the mix of $1,400 checks to individuals, more generous jobless uh, and safety net benefits are going to help power a rapid increase in economic growth. And it's going to help people that need to buy groceries now, pay bills, avoid foreclosure. Um, and the focus is going to be on these um uh, people as opposed to the high earners who would more likely add to the savings that uh, Ryan alluded to. So I predict, as, as many economists do, uh, that the increase in consumer spending is going to uh, increase business production and will probably lead to the fastest growth rate that we have seen in nearly 40 years. Now, the second phase of this plan um, is the forthcoming infrastructure project that Jerry uh, made reference to. And this package is going to include uh, the traditional infrastructure investments that you would expect, roads and highways. But it's also going to focus on green energy and climate change initiatives, as well as child care, health care and education. Now, according to the Bank of America, um, you know, not a, a liberal bastion by, by any sort. Uh, the GDP uh, is likely to grow by as much as 9% in the short run and in the long run, probably considerably more. Um, and finally, let me make reference uh, to something that Ryan mentioned, is that small businesses in particular, but large businesses, including the airline industry, the hotel industry, restaurant chains, um, but small businesses in particular have suffered tremendously uh, from this pandemic. And one of the things that is so glaringly different uh, in the first 40 days or so of the Biden administration is a consistent message on how to stay safe, wear a mask, keep your distance, wash your hands, stay at home when you can. Uh, this kind of consistent message and a coordinated uh, effort at the federal level on the production and distribution of vaccines are going to allow us to open up the economy probably fully by July. So I do believe and I do reach the conclusion that this uh, this 
these two problems, the uh, COVID relief package and the infrastructure package that we will see soon, uh, are going to make a big difference in the short run and the long run. And I, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco. Um, JD, you get not quite the last word, but you get to go uh, last in the discussion and perhaps uh, to pick up on some of the comments that Francisco uh, and Jerry have made. You made Thank you very much, Laha. It's great to join you in this distinguished panel today. Thanks to Frank Jurgen Richter for the kind invitation to join Harassus again. I appreciate it. And uh, like Jerry, I also look forward to the in-person version someday. <laughs> um, I agree with many of the points made by all the panelists. Um, I think Ryan's point was excellent that uh, Joe Biden is the president, but yet he uh, uh, ha has a lot of factors that are beyond his control. He shares power, of course, with the Congress and the Supreme Court. Also, our federal government shares power with the states and local governments. The coronavirus lockdowns really have been catastrophic for the United States. One out of every four small businesses closed in 2020, according to a report on CBS last <coughs> week. And um, the New York Times uh, ran a couple of graphs on, on the front page, top of the fold, about a week ago, showing that um, even though we're making progress from where we were before, tens of millions of people had lost their jobs, uh, we are still not back up to where we should be now. Those graphs in the New York Times showed that um, Hispanic women and black women are um, minus 8% and 10% of where they were in the workforce before as far as numbers. And in uh, December alone, 150,000 black women left the workforce. So that, that is tremendous and we need to do better. We need to um, accelerate the return to normality. So I would say that Joe Biden is only one piece of that. Uh, the uh, other piece of it is the United States is changing dramatically. With these small businesses closing, what we've seen is the rise of global corporations doing a lot better. And I think it's important to take a look at some of the numbers that just through 2020, some of the uh, the growth of the top companies, if you look at Amazon and PayPal, uh, they, they increased by 79% in their value in 2020. eBay and Apple, 57% increase. Netflix, 52%. FedEx and UPS, 36%. Microsoft, 34%. And if you look at a lot of the, the, the major stores, Walmart, Target, Costco, uh, they remained open during the pandemic because they have pharmacies. Meanwhile, small businesses, a lot of them closed. If you look at malls in the United States now doing terribly, shuttered, a lot of stores are shuttered throughout. Uh, meanwhile, if you look at uh, some of the, the, the top corporate CEOs and the, the amount of money they made compared to others uh, in the middle class and the, the working class, uh, over the seven-month period during the pandemic, USA Today reported in December, uh, American, America's 614 billionaires gained a net worth of $931 billion. And if you look at some of the top people, Lin Bin, originally of China, plus $4.7 billion, what he was worth. Jack Dorsey of Twitter, uh, $7.8 billion more than what he was worth. Uh, then you get to the top couple, of course, Elon Musk, uh, plus $68 billion. Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon and the new owner of the Washington Post, plus 90 billion. Now, I don't think in a democracy, in a successful democracy, you can sustain that type of income inequality and wealth inequality. Now, I'm very pleased to see that President Biden is going ahead with tax hikes on people making more than 400,000 a year, which roughly is equivalent to the top 1% of income earners, varies a little bit by state. But that's positive and also a, a hike for corporations, because I believe global corporations may do better under President Biden. But I don't, I don't really think the, the working class will, even with the, the generous one point nine uh, trillion dollars in the covid relief package. Um, only about nine percent of that actually even goes to fight covid as far as uh, fight covid directly with uh, uh, vaccine distribution, virus testing. It's, it's, it's a welfare program, essentially, for the most part. And there's a lot of government bloat and pork in there. So uh, I, I think that uh, this issue, as far as rebounding our economy, is a lot bigger than Joe Biden. Our country is changing. Small businesses are suffering. 
and corporations are growing. And so the, the tax hikes will be good from President Biden. But overall, this issue is a, is a lot bigger than uh, Joe Biden himself. And the last point to mention is the national debt. We're $28 trillion in debt right now. And our GDP is only $21 trillion. That's not a formula for success moving forward. Thank you very much, J.D. We're already starting to get questions from uh, Simone Filippini. He's posted one in. I will take it up in a second. If you are watching and have a question you'd like to ask, do post. Um, I think it's also a grab mic thing if I can figure out how that works, but um, do post in the chat room. Um, let me start, however, by picking up on one of the things that Ryan said, um, perhaps. Ryan, you were talking about what's good for corporations, what's good for growth and potential growth rates and the like. I mean, the economic gains that were seen in pre-financial crisis or even in the last decade, perhaps people have the general public hasn't been very happy perhaps how the split has happened between labor and capital and that has led to around the world election of people who are chat tackling that sort of you know split and saying they can shift the needle a little bit towards labor I mean, what do you think about the corporate tax rates the higher income tax on high earners um i'll open it up for all of you but perhaps ryan you'd like to start okay well um i i think one first point is that it's worth noting that by the time we got to 2019 with the tight labor markets we had, actually wage growth amongst workers was faster than uh, managers and uh, amongst African-Americans was faster than uh, white Americans. And so actually we were beginning to see finally with a tight labor market, uh, some of that in work inequality uh, falling. And I just think the, the, the rising corporation tax rate is kind of a false promise for, for working Americans. Um, what ultimately matters from an economic perspective is not who legally pays the tax, but who bears the economic incidence of the tax. And economists have done lots of work assessing um, who bears the burden of corporate tax hikes, corporation taxes around the world um, over the past few decades. And um, most of that analysis seems to suggest that somewhere between a third and two thirds of the burden in the longer term uh, is borne by workers. Um, because workers tend to be less mobile than capital. Why is that? Well, with higher tax rate that raise the, um, uh, raise the user cost of capital, uh, firms tend to invest less. If you invest less, the productivity of the workers uh, doesn't go up as high, and that ultimately feeds through into lower wages. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that it, obviously, the net impact depends on what you then spend those revenues on, right? So I'm not saying that corporation tax rates pay for themselves. This is not some sort of Laffer curve argument. Um, but I don't think it's this automatic gain to workers um, that many people are presenting it as. Um, ultimately, some of that tax hike, a large proportion of that tax hike will be borne by workers in the longer term. We might not observe it in the same way that we observe the money being spent out. But, you know, economics suggests it will have that effect. Jerry, I think he wants to come in. Yeah, I, I think uh, what Ryan is heading for is the right direction, and I would just like to sort of push it another notch. The bigger force with labor and capital is automation. Uh, capital's realized that automation is cheaper, works 24 hours a day, doesn't go on strike, whole set of things which push it towards automation, and that's undermined the existing labor force because we didn't skill up our labor force to compete against robots. We skilled them up to be good mechanics, good physical laborers. Uh, much of that work is going to disappear. Uh, and in the course of that, the Biden administration, if they want to honor labor's needs, needs to look to education and skills. And the green economy plays into that because by creating a green economy, you pull towards a new set of technologies, a new set of things that have to be done requiring skilled labor to do it. We've been doing a project in New York where they're beginning to reduce energy consumption in buildings. So we create a program which has not only the technology to provide reduced energy, but the workforce training for workers to do the work in all those buildings. If that pull takes place, then education will respond with skill training to match those needs 
and we'll see our labor force walk its way up to, as I like to say, be as smart as a robot or know how to work beside a robot. That's the challenge. And I think the Biden administration has the, the power to do that. It's going to be important that the education team, that the labor team and the commerce team all deliver the uh, opportunity for workers to make that movement. Thank you, Jerry. Let me take a question that's just popped up. I'm going to come back to Simone's question afterwards, uh, immediately after this. But uh, George, who's the CEO of Endurance Lasers, uh, is asking, uh, uh, we shouldn't under, what well, saying, we shouldn't underestimate the inflation risks that are coming through at the moment. We've had people like Larry Summers, a former U.S. Treasury Secretary, Olivier Blanchard, um, who used to head up uh, the chief economist, uh, former chief economist of the National Monetary Fund, have both warned that the amount of fiscal spending in the U.S., both through the COVID relief act and then followed up by infrastructure. They support the infrastructure spending, but just wondering if this amount of immediate relief was needed. They're saying together, and I think George is making the same point, that um, inflation will come back with this amount of money being injected into the economy and that we may have to hit the brakes quite hard with interest rates. I don't know. Are any of you concerned about this? Yes. No. Um, JD, I'll let you go first and then come back to Jerry. Or Yes, being $20 trillion in debt, we're eventually going to get to a period where we have inflation and that's going to be unsustainable. I think the uh, Francisco knows this in more detail than I do, but I'll, I'll give a more sort of high level picture. We, the pandemic sucked an enormous amount of cash out of the economy, no transactions, people not working. We've got some absorption power to take this money. Now, the way we came out of World War II, and to some extent the way we did well in the 90s, was to increase our productivity. We're at a point where we can see a big productivity bump. Uh, automation is strong. Uh, there's other telemedicine, things like this are, are giving people an hour a day of wa- saved wasted time. Instead of a half a day to go to a doctor, it's 15 minutes on a video call. That puts you back at work. You know, basically, you never left. That's a productivity jump. So there's things happening that go in the right direction. I think we can earn our way out of this. It will require really... I'm putting in a lot more hours. I'm not sure productivity, if it's measured by output per hours, is going up. It's just more hours. Um, let me, sorry, somebody wanted to jump in? I, I was just. Yeah, go ahead, Francisco. Very briefly, uh, I, I think JD's right that we, we can't totally ignore debt. Um, nevertheless, uh, difficult times require extraordinary measures. Jerry made reference to World War II, um, and, and I would say prior to that, that the depression. Um, and, and so the, the, the key is that we make investments um, that can help create the productivity that Jerry talks about. We, we had a massive tax cut under the Trump administration. And, and honestly, we saw a lot of share buybacks, but I'm not sure we saw the investment that we had hoped for. So if we're making the right investments um, under these kind of difficult times, uh, I, I believe that uh, deficit spending is merited. Can I just come come in on this inflation risk? So I think there is a high risk that inflation will, uh, in the US and other countries, potentially jump above its target uh, in the near term as the velocity of money gets going again. How much you consider that a problem really depends on whether you think the the current inflation targeting regime is the right one. You know, if you were targeting a price level, inflation has been lower than target for the past year. So some catch up it perhaps is not the end of the world. What really matters uh, in terms of its longer term impacts is whether as a result of inflation being above target, people start to doubt the credibility of the Fed in terms of worrying about inflation. Um, I, I think that risk is maybe a little overblown, but I think we should be cognizant of it. Thank you. Let me go back to Simone's question. I think I have somebody who's got the hand up to take the mic. Um, uh, but let me try and go back to Simone's question, which was, um, we'll come back to the, the gentleman who wants the mic, about 
how do we, I mean, uh, Simone's saying, I don't know where the data is coming from, so I'm just going to read out her question, is that this 2020 CO2 levels in the US were higher than ever before, despite COVID. Uh, I'm not sure what the sourcing is on that, but anyway. Um, how does the panel feel about the need, uh, or how do they think the radical transformation will happen needed to bring these sort of things down, the levels down? And how do you think huge inequalities in the US will be reduced? Do you think we're going about it the right way? I guess she's asking. You like to I'll, start very, I'll start very briefly. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, the, the Biden plan really focuses on focuses on low wage earners. So it is uh, in an effort to try to help address some of the inequality that we deal with. We're, we've already seen uh, researchers that have said the poverty rate for adults and the poverty rate for children will go down under the COVID relief. And on the infrastructure plan, um, I, I too, so I'm not sure where that number comes from, but whether it's right or, or whether it's off a little, there's no question that we have a problem with climate. And, and the infrastructure plan that President Biden is going to put forward uh, begins to address that in ways that we have not yet seen. So I, I think he's doing, I think he's, he's attacking both the inequality as well as some of the challenges that I don't believe we've made adequate investments to date to address. Can I just Hi, come back I, on the... Oh, perfect. Yeah, go for it. So um, I, I have no reason to doubt that uh, Francisco's... Um, you know, figures are correct on on what the plan does for child poverty. But um, I don't really see how, you know, reducing poverty sustainably can come about by a one time stimulus. Um, And I don't think Francisco is uh, suggesting that. But unless unless there's kind of ongoing uh, either more redistribution or or that spending helps propel people into new situations, then, you know, we, we end up back in the same place in a year or two's time. And, you know, big increases in government programs eventually need to be paid for, too. And those tax rises can have impacts on economic growth. So, you know, I don't think it's as simple as as just giving people money. And I think that's where um, the broader range of government policies come in, including the investments we're talking about, including um, the configuration of the tax system and and the regulatory state. On on climate change, though, um, you know, people talk about this as if it's win, 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 win. Um, climate change is no doubt a, a major problem. It's a major externality problem in economic terms that has to be dealt with. But there are different ways of dealing with it. You could try it as far as possible to impose um, the social cost of carbon, have that through some sort of carbon tax or, or carbon price, and then allow markets to find the cheapest ways of, of, of working around that. Um, or you can go down this kind of industrial policy route where you try and have the government uh, pick the technologies that it thinks are going to deliver that transition. I worry we're doing too much of the of the latter, too much of the industrial planning, which doesn't really have um, doesn't really have um, good historical bona fides when you look at the record of industrial planning across the world. I think anybody wants to come back. Yeah, Jerry. Well, I would just add. Uh, I'm chairman of the New York Academy of Sciences, and uh, one of my friends is uh, Ponch, who's the head of the National Science Foundation. If you look at Ponch's uh, point of view coming from Arizona State, where they were very concerned about access, about uh, impact on the full society, uh, he will take the NSF and move it much more towards doing things which create new science and new research, leading to new technology, leading to new jobs and new solutions. So you've got to wrap the Biden administration in this bigger picture of, of people who you can even hear in this discussion, the opponents, you know, the two that got assigned to be opponents of the Biden team are talking about redistribution. They're talking about getting people back to work. They're talking about any number of things which are pretty closely aligned with what the Biden team wants, approach may be slightly different. So there's a lot going on that's pulling us forward. Whether it'll be radical, I doubt. I mean, I was Undersecretary of the Navy, and I think you, you're not going to make radical changes. You're not going to get rid of aircraft carriers during your term in office. But you may plant the seeds of a new way of fighting wars that 20 years later begins to show up as a real thing. And the green economy's got that power. This is not 
today it all changes. This is building the base for significant change and we'll reap those benefits years to come. Cool. Let me take a leap of faith and see if I can get the mic to somebody who had, um, it's Mahendra, I think, and you have the mic. working. Hi. Hi, Mahendra. Hi. Hi. How are you? Uh, I, have, I have three quick questions. Uh, I've been following this time the U.S. elections very closely. And the first question which comes to my mind is, uh, is Joe Biden administration thinking of uh, the constitutional amendments for election system in uh, U.S.? First question. The second is, uh, what are uh, the current thoughts in the administration regarding H-1B visa for most of the uh, like uh, IT workers and engineers? The third is uh, uh, the decision regarding uh, migration issues with Mexico and the wall which was planned by, by uh, Trump administration. So could uh, one of you throw some light and... Uh, Particularly, I'm chatting with uh, Jerry, if you could uh, talk to me about uh, that part. Mahendra, thank you very much for the questions and for keeping it short. I'm just going to take the mic back so the uh, speakers can go, but thank you for your questions. Thank you. Uh, go for it. I think uh, whoever, Jerry, uh, was it you that it was addressed to or anybody else wants to pick it up? But go first, Jerry. Uh, Mahendra is a friend of mine from India, so I appreciate him coming on with the question. Uh, we're, we're kind of stepping out of the range of our discussion. Uh, I, I think that uh, clearly the Biden administration is going to pay attention to the immigration issue and the uh, border issues, which has got to come up with some quick solutions. And uh, so the, you're seeing the, the movement on that already. Let's see what the workout on it is. Uh, I would expect to see us open up on visas. I haven't looked at it closely uh, just because we've, seen the benefit of international talent uh, coming to America. Silicon Valley is a perfect example of what it means to bring new brains to uh, to bear on opportunity. So I'm expecting to see that. That's a uh, could be very productive. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump uh, in? I'll just, I'll just quickly jump in on what I think was the first question. Uh, whether or not the Biden administration will support some kind of constitutional amendment to protect voting rights. If I, if, if I got, did I get that right? Did yeah. somebody, um, I'm not sure if he would support a constitutional amendment, but I'm pretty confident he'll support the legislation that's currently before Congress that in to some regard, to, to some degree is in reaction to some very troubling legislation at the state level that seeks to make it harder for people to vote. Uh, that's the last thing we should be doing. We should be increasing participatory democracy and the legislation that Congress is considering would do that. And I'm confident the Biden administration will be an active supporter of that legislation. Perfect. Our time is really running out. Uh, I have two minutes left. Before I thank you all, I'm going to go around um, and ask you, will President Biden make the US economy great again for Sum up and a yes or no is all you're going to get, and uh, maybe with two extra words. Um, Ryan, over to you first. The economy will get better under Joe Biden. I don't think he will make the economy great. Okay, Jerry. I think we're uh, riding a wave, and that's a positive wave. And if the Biden seems very bright, and I think they'll be agile on their feet, and I think they'll recognize some of the issues we've discussed today, adjust to them. And the economy will get much better, uh, partly because America is a great country and it will get better on its own. But well, you've gone way over yes or no, but yeah. <laughs> <We agree. laughs> There's no but. <laughs> um, I'm going to let J JD before we get cut off. JD, very quickly, and then Francisco last. Uh, no, I don't think so. Just because the changes that are happening in America are a lot bigger than just Joe Biden. Uh, I think uh, on the positive side, what I could say about him is that the, the tax increases on uh, top earners and on corporations are a good step ahead. Thank you. And Francisco, you have the last word before we get cut. Uh, the answer is yes. And if we do this right, if it's executed right, the, the, the long-term effects will also be very, very positive. Brilliant. 
Thank you all four of you and to the audience for your great contributions and for your thoughts. Uh, enjoy the rest of Horasis and uh, see you soon, hopefully. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye, everybody.